Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. This is our first town hall. We just opened up the studio a few days ago, and we're going to do our first town hall about how finance exploits all of us. It's a very important topic for us at the Real News because one of the main reasons we came to Baltimore was to take up one critical question, which is more or less, what would you do if you ran Baltimore in the interest of the majority of its people? Of course, there's sort of a built-in assumption there that it's not currently the case. But that's what we think. I think the facts would lead one there. But if, if in fact, you had a, a mayor, a city councillor, if you had a governor, a state assembly, and their only interest was the majority of the people's well-being, what would that public policy actually look like? It's easy to critique the existing system. Um, it's perhaps not so easy to say what you would really do. And over the next year, two or three years, we want to do investigative journalism. We're going to do town hall discussions and debates and talks and film screenings and all manner of formats, but all directed at the same basic objective. What would public policy look like if it was only in the interests of ordinary people? So we're going to kick it off tonight and talk about how finance exploits all of us with our guest Kostas Lepovitsis. The um, topic is very important and it's a very good topic particularly for Baltimore because Baltimore is the home of the subprime mortgage. Uh, most people that follow this know that the 2008 financial crisis was triggered by a banking crisis that to a large extent was triggered by subprime mortgages, the people that were lent money, banks knowing they could never repay the mortgages and not really caring if the mortgages were ever repaid because they would package hundreds and even thousands of these mortgages, sell them on the derivatives markets to pension funds and other banks and the whole thing was a house of cards and uh, I guess they had either an underlying belief that American real estate could never collapse or they didn't care because they were making such fees on the whole thing they really didn't care if the whole thing came down because most of the people playing this game did cashed out very well and they make money before the crash and they make money after the crash. And Baltimore was the target of all this, not in the 2000s but in the 1990s. This is where the whole subprime experiment began and it was all targeted at African Americans, deliberately so. And it's come out in court documents since, a lawsuit that the city of Baltimore uh, launched against Wells Fargo Bank. It came out that it was specifically targeted to African Americans. They would hire African American loan officers to sell this stuff. They would not care at all whether people could pay. They would promise low interest rates to start and then later of course it would balloon up and the people would lose their houses. In the year 2000, subprime mortgages was the number one cause of foreclosures in Baltimore long before it became a national phenomena. So this is sort of an example of how we want to tie systemic issues like big banks, predatory lending, and how this appears locally and how it screws up people's lives and over time start talking about what an alternative financial system and not just financial but other ways of managing a city and a state and someday a country might look like. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest tonight. And uh, he is Kostas Lapovitsis, and as I, he's a professor of economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He's a member of Research on Money Finance, RMF, and the lead author of the new RMF report, Breaking Up, A Route Out of the Eurozone Crisis. His previous publications include Crisis in the Eurozone, Social Foundations of Markets, Money and Credit, and Political Economy of Money and Finance. And Kostas is going to speak for... 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a, a Q&A. And uh, I look forward to hearing it all. So go ahead, Kostas. I will present to you some ideas that um, I have dealt with in uh, my new book, Profiting Without Producing, which has just come out, uh, which discuss finance and the rise of finance. I can't tell you very much about Baltimore because I don't know about it, but I will tell you um, uh, quite a few things about um, what I call the financialization of capitalism, which mm. impacts on Baltimore and on many other places. So, getting on with it, and very quickly because time is short, I think it's fair to say, and all of us would agree, that finance has an extraordinary presence in contemporary mature economies. It's very clear in the case of the US, but equally clear in the case of the United Kingdom where I live, Japan, about which I know quite a bit, Germany, and so on. 
There's no question at all about it. Finance is the sector of the economy in mature countries which has grown uh, enormously in terms of size relative to the rest of the economy. In terms of penetration into um, everyday lives of ordinary people, but also small and medium businesses and just about everybody. And um, in terms of policy influence, finance clearly influences uh, economic policy on a national level in country after country. The interests of finance are paramount in forming economic policy. So, th so that is clear. Finance has become extraordinarily powerful and that, in a sense, is the first immediate way in which we can understand financialization. Something has happened there and modern mature capitalism appears to have financialized. Now what is this financialization? The best I can do right now is to give you the gist of this argument of mine in, in my book and I would come clean immediately and tell you that I think financialization is basically a profound historical transformation of modern capitalism. This is the way I understand it. It's a profound historical transformation that really began in the 1970s and it's now been running for about four decades. How to understand then a, a profound historical transformation? How to, how to go about it? What concepts do we need? I think we need, first of all, to look at some economic processes, some economic change that has taken place, fundamental economic change. And then we'll, we need to look at some changes in politics and institutions and combine the two in order to, um, to grasp the historical change. So let me start with the economic changes, the economic foundations of this transformation. I think that there are, there are three key um, root changes here. The first, funnily enough, doesn't relate to finance itself, but it relates to industry and commerce. In other words, it relates to non-financial uh, economic activity. One must start there to understand the historical transformation. So what has happened to big business in particular? Well, what's happened to big business is very interesting. Two things have happened to it. First, big business has become increasingly capable of financing investment out of retained earnings. It retains its profits, and on a net basis, it finances investment pretty much out of that. Of course, it still uses banks, but it doesn't rely on banks uh, on a net basis to finance investment. That gives it independence, a certain degree of independence from banks. In addition to that, big business has made so much in retained profits. Currently, uh, US big business is sitting on piles of, uh, of cash. He has made so much in retained profits that he can use um, those funds to play financial games, to engage in financial uh, transactions and financial activities on, on its own account. So big business has financialized. The key element that we've got to understand first is the financialization of big business. Large enterprises have acquired some of the character of financial institutions, have become bank-like, and they engage in these transactions, and they change the structure of their own organization as they do that. So that's the first thing. Second economic change, and very, very important too, relates to banks. If big business is doing that, banks must do something else to make profit. Banks are profit-making institutions. So if big business becomes increasingly independent of banks, banks must do something else. What have banks done? It's very clear what they've done. They lend less uh, to businesses for investment and so on, and they play more games in the financial markets. They become transactors in financial assets, and they make profits increasingly, not from lending, but from fees, commissions, and trading. They become traders in financial assets. At the same time, banks have also turned to households. Households have become a very profitable activity of banks, a new activity. This is a new phenomenon in the development of capitalism. So that much about banks. The third change has to do with households, workers, ordinary people. Now what we see there in the last three to four decades is that ordinary people have been drawn into the formal financial system like never before. Households have become financialized. Finance has become a fundamental part of household life. Uh, like I say, uh, like never before. Why is that? Partly because wages have been stagnant. 
and therefore uh, no more, I mean, nowhere more stagnant than in this country. I mean, real wages have been absolutely flat in this country for decades. Um, but so partly because of that, people have, have, have turned to debt. But also people have got assets, financial assets. So the financialization of everyday life of households is a bit of a complex story. What is actually happening there, I think, is not simply that you borrow in order to consume. That also happens. It's a more complex story than that. What is actually happening is people need uh, access to health, education, uh, housing, and then a variety of other needs. Every country has systems of provision for these things. Each country differs from uh, the next country, but pretty much th th there are similarities. These modes of provision have historically, traditionally incorporated public provision. Some methods of public provision for everything, for housing, for health, for education, and so on. What we've witnessed the last three to four decades is a retreat of public provision. Public provision is retreated, private provision is taken its place. As this has happened, finance has emerged as the facilitator of that. So we turn to private provision to solve our housing needs, our health needs, our education needs, and finance makes profits out of that, basically, without having any skills in doing, uh, in doing these things. So this, to me, is the financialization um, of households, the third major trend. So non-financials have financialized, banks have changed, and households have been drawn into the financial system. This, these changes together have basically transformed the economy, transformed the foundations uh, of the economy. This is a new type of capitalism. At the same time, we've had changes in institutions and in ideology. These you would have heard about, and you would be familiar with. The changes in institutions are very clear. We've had wave after wave of deregulation. The labor market has become more deregulated, and financial markets have become more deregulated. And in addition to deregulation, what we've had is the rise of the ideology of neoliberalism. Deregulation goes, go, goes hand in hand with neoliberalism. The idea that the market is good, the state is bad. In this country, this is a very powerfully held idea, more powerfully here than, than anywhere else. Actually, it's extraordinary how powerful this uh, perception is and how a lot of social issues are understood in this way. The point I want to make to you is that neoliberalism is very, very powerful and sustains financialization, but neoliberalism is not really about uh, asserting the merits of the market over the state. Actually, it's more complex than that, and it's more crafty than that, because neoliberal, neoliberals are not the enemies of the state. Neoliberals want to take over the state. The actual, the actual content of neoliberal ideology is to take over the state and to use the state to protect the market, to make the market bigger, to, uh, to, 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 to effect market, market favoring and market conducive changes. So this has also been going on um, the last three to four decades, and that to me is the core of financialization. So what have we got after four decades of this? These changes, seen very clearly in the United States, have created, firstly, a deeply unequal uh, country, a deeply unequal uh, society. Um, financialization is fundamentally about inequality. We see this inequality in terms of income, where the, the top 10% uh, and the top 1% um, draw an extraordinary proportion uh, of income uh, annually, but we see it in terms of the function, functional distribution, the distribution of uh, income between capital and labor, where labor has lost and lost dramatically during the last three to four deca decades in this country and in just about every other mature capitalist country uh, that has financialized. So this is a deeply unequal uh, system. It generates inequality. Finance has acted as a key lever in increasing inequality. Fi finance is a, is a vital mechanism uh, in increasing inequality. You can see it in terms of the profits it creates. Financial profit has become 
a huge part of total profit through these activities that I just discussed by markets, households, and so on, a huge part of total profit. And the rich in this country and elsewhere typically become rich through financial methods. The way in which you acquire great wealth and you cream off um, so the surplus is basically um, through financial methods, through access to financial assets, privileged ways of trading uh, financial assets, and privileged position in the financial system that allows you to extract vast returns which appear as salaries and wages. In other words, remuneration for labor. Come on, what kind of remuneration for labor is this that allows someone to draw tens of millions of dollars annually for what kind of labor? This isn't labor, this is a kind of rent. This is a kind of surplus accruing because of uh, power and position in the financial system or access to finance. And that is typical of financialization in this country and elsewhere. Mm -hmm.